And we move on. We have with us a very dear friend who was actually the person who got me thinking about creating the Rex Global Fellowships. He's an Emmy Award winner, Kaizad Kotwal, who's been working with his mother, Mahabanu Kotwal, who's also a Karmavir Puraskar awardee. He's been very active in the, on, on the issue of gender rights and gender justice for many years. And Kaizad has just launched a huge movement, which is called One Billion Rising to End the Global War on Women. When I nominated Kaizad for the Karmavir Puraskar, because he's done a lot of work, he said, Jerry, I don't think I deserve this honor at this stage because I need to do more. And maybe next year when I get the one billion campaign going. And that actually was a trigger point, Kaizad, where I started thinking, how do we get people like you who have that integrity, who have that intent to do something into the fraternity any which way? And that's how the Rex Global Fellowships concept started kind of playing in my head. And I'm happy that we have a whole lot of Rex Karmavir Global Fellows here. Kaizad Kotwal, playwright, actor, wears multiple hats. He's going to speak about his concept, the idea, one billion rising to end the global war on women. <clears throat> Good evening, and uh, thanks for that intro, Jerry. And uh, I'm humbled and <clears throat> honored at the same time. I'm extremely um, activated and also angered at the sort of issues that people have been raising, which um, are very, very worthy of attention, and, and, and angered because those issues <laughs> exist in a society where they shouldn't. Um, on the 8th of December, 2010, a 13-year-old girl was abducted by four boys, raped and left by the roadside. That girl somehow managed to crawl through a brick kiln for help, only to be raped by two workers again. When she was finally let go in the evening, a rickshaw driver offered her to give her a lift, only to rape her again and dump her on the same road. Left for dead and crying for help, the young teen was picked up by a truck driver and his aide, and you may have guessed it by now, they raped her repeatedly for nine days. In July of 2011, three men raped a three and a half year old girl. Yesterday, um, we were privileged enough to hear from Dr. Nairin Daruwala of the Sneha organization from the Dharabi slums of Mumbai a shelter that we've supported for many years. That shelter actually started when its founder, Dr. Armida Fernandez, who worked at the neonatal department of Sion Hospital, was one day brought a young child of two months old who had been slit from the vagina to the umbilicus because somebody had tried to rape her under the belief that if he raped a virgin, his diseases would be cured. The two cases that I mentioned of the young girl who had been raped repeatedly and the three and a half year old girl happened right here in neighboring Haryana. There is an epidemic of rapes in that state and in this country and perhaps even in the world which begs for the imposition of martial law or peacekeeping troops from the UN. But then again, we know that peacekeeping troops from the UN are also responsible for rape. And nothing is being done to stop any of these atrocities. In the Haryana case, to add insult to injury, the former Chief Minister Om Prakash Chautala said that girls needed to be allowed to be married off at a, quote, very young age to protect them from rapes, end quote. A DSP there, Yashpal Khatana, offers as an explanation for the frequency of rapes the fact that, quote, girls are easily influenced these days. They wear Western clothes, so the number of gang rapes will increase, end quote. And the icing on the cake, Chinese food. Quote, chow mein leads to hormonal imbalances evoking an urge to indulge in such acts, said Jitendar Chattar, Kaap Panchayat leader. 
burgers and pizzas were also seen as rape-inducing foods. We may laugh at the absurdity, but none of these so-called leaders is even half-joking. They are deadly serious, sadly. And deadly serious also is the war on women. Often when I use this phrase, the war on women, there is a confusion about the linguistic framing. Surely people say to me, you must mean a war against women. But no, it is a war on women. So why or how or what is a war on women? The answer is simple. Increasingly, conflicts around the world are being fought quite literally on the bodies of women and girls. Religious institutions, political organizations, social norms, cultural protocols, governments, and increasingly corporations have started to use the bodies of women and girls to fight for the agendas that they are vested in. This isn't necessarily a new phenomenon, but it seems that the fervor with which women are being violated is new. There is, without a doubt, a war on women being fought in just about every country in the world, including the United States and in Europe. And because this war is so proliferated, so simultaneously engaging so many nations in it, we don't think of it as a war, and hence we don't see it as worthy of resources to try and restore women to a place of safety and peace. Currently, there is a war ongoing in the Congo, a war being fought largely over the small minerals such as tantalum, tungsten, tin, gold, and coltan, used largely in our cell phones, digital cameras, portable music devices, computers, Game Boys, and PlayStations. This war is the second longest conflict in the history of the world and has claimed close to six million lives. It's still ongoing. So the, con the, the number of fatalities is second only to the Holocaust in Europe between the two world wars. In this war, men of certain villages have been wiped out, and women are being abused in ways that are unimaginable. An octogenarian grandmother was gang raped by 11 teenage boys. Sons are routinely asked to rape their mothers and sisters at gunpoint, and then killed. Some women and girls are raped so often that they develop holes in their body, fistulae, which prevent them from retaining any bodily fluids, and as a result, they smell and no one wants to touch them. No one gives them any affection. And yet, who is really paying attention? Where is the Indian media's reportage on this? Why are we not demanding conflict-free telephones in this nation with the second largest telephony in the world? And when will this war truly end? Even in the US in the most recent presidential election, the Republican Party was on an unprecedented rampage to take women's rights and reproductive and other rights back to the 50s not the 1950s, but perhaps the 1750s. So as you look around the world today, what we find is sadly that not only are the rates of violence against women and girls not going down, they're in fact exponentially on the rise. And worse, the types of violence being inflicted on the bodies of women and girls get more and more lurid, more and more macabre. For those of us who have been involved to varying degrees to raise awareness and funds to combat and diminish violence towards women and girls, we have always somehow operated under the subconscious assumption that the violence would at some point end. We, would not ha we, we could not have been more wrong about that. It's not that we underestimated the depths of the problem. It's not that we deluded ourselves into believing that the roots of this problem are not deep and widely proliferated. And it's also not true that we wishfully hope for something that today seems impossible. What turns out to be true is that patriarchy is a more formidable foe than we had ever imagined. What has become super evident is that even as women have gained in some areas in some parts of the world, patriarchy has only become stronger and stronger, aided, I might add, magnificently by the all-consuming corporate structures that have taken over almost every single aspect of our lives. Patriarchy does not, as it turns out, want to share or diminish its power at all. In fact, patriarchy has often done so well is to co-opt women into doing its bidding against other women. So from the horror stories of mothers-in-law who badger, sometimes to death, their daughters-in-law over dowry, to women in the corporate structure world having to appear more and more masculine the higher they climb that Nasdaq and Wall Street ladder, Women are co-opted by patriarchy to continue the domination of other women. This works insidiously at two levels. First, it allows men to appear less complicit in the crimes against women 
by the fact that women are now co-opted into doing their dirty work. And second, it allows men to turn around and say, it's just not us men. Look, it's women who are also doing bad things to other women. And patriarchy is blind to caste, religion, geography, culture, region, nation, continent, and even social and economic strata. One of the most horrifying findings in many studies in India is that violence is often more prevalent in better educated, more well-to-do communities. So while we hear about the atrocities of the Kap Panchayats, how often do you hear about elite Malabar Hill in Mumbai, which has one of the highest rates of female feticide in this city, perhaps even in the country? Here, the rich don't have to break gender identification laws. They can simply afford to whisk away to Singapore, Dubai, London, and with the first fetus is a female, simply abort it before returning to a marvelous hilltop view of the Arabian Sea and lush foliage all around in their multi-million dollar apartments. According to a United Nations report in 2004, one, and I want you to listen to this number very carefully, one out of every three women in the world today is a survivor of violence or some form of rape, some form of beating or some form of sexual violence. If you do the math, that means that at this given moment in the world, we have over one billion women who have been violated. One billion. In India, the number of women who are violated is closer to one out of every two. So the numbers are staggering, the scope of the problem mind-boggling, and this unnamed war, an ongoing silent holocaust. And change, though seemingly impossible, and the light at the end of the tunnel most definitively not quite within sight yet, we still have to keep working towards that. Which brings me to this, this notion of one billion rising that Jerry mentioned, and I, I want to just clarify that the idea is not really my idea, um, but we've been working with the playwright of the Vagina Monologues, a play that some of you may be aware of, um, and she has, is, is starting this new movement on February 14th of next year called One Billion Rising, and we're helping her here in India uh, to, to launch the Indian initiative. Um, and, and the idea of One Billion Rising is that our hope is, Eve's hope and our hope, is that one billion people, women, their supporters, their husbands, their brothers, their sons, their employers, their bosses, um, will get out into the public arenas. You will leave your workspace for about 15 or 20 minutes on that day. You can gather in your lobby, you can gather in the lawn outside your office building, you can gather in a communal room um, at the hospital you work at, wherever, and you will dance. And, and you will dance for 20 minutes, or half an hour, or however long you can, for the simple reason that for the first time in the world, we hope, will any issue have mobilized one billion people to focus their attention on a particular problem. So while it may seem frivolous that, that, that you know, we're gonna get out and dance, that's just the beginning. But it is important to make that symbolic statement. It is important to make that statement to the world to say that one billion of us, or perhaps even more, are now aware and ready to do something about this. The, the, the reason that I, I, I raise the, uh, that I've been focused on this issue of gender violence for so long is that many of the problems that we've talked about today have at the root the fact that we do not value women. And if you switch that around, if we start valuing women right from the start, from the womb, with prenatal care, and you know, we could, we could go on and on about that, a lot of the problems that many of you are dealing with in your own amazing ways would also start to diminish, if not disappear. I'll end with just a couple more things. In a poll of 370 gender experts on how well women faced in the G20 countries, India, they don't tell you this in India Shining, was ranked the worst country to be a woman. Saudi Arabia was better than us. You know that you are a democracy only in name when your gender rights and welfare situation is worse than that of a theocracy based on religious fundamentalism. The real solutions to ending violence against women is the reevaluation of patriarchy and its sure but steady dismantling. 
that's a far bigger challenge than the human mind has yet been able to wrap itself around. So the work that my mother and I have been doing for the last 10 years or so, um, we have used art as an agent of activism and fundraising to combat this war on women. I want to end with a, a poem that Eve Ensler herself has written with her work, uh, based on her work in the Congo. She wrote this piece after interviewing an eight-year-old girl named Noella at the Pansy Hospital in Congo. And after the interview, Eve tried to hug Noella, and she squirmed away. Eve realized that Noella probably hadn't been hugged since she had been raped by a group of militia every day for two weeks straight. The rapes had destroyed her insides and <clears throat> given her fistula so she had no ability to hold her pee. Eve hugged her anyway and held her on her lap and after realized that there was no turning back. I end this piece with this poem not as some rhetorical flourish or as some speechwriter's grand scheme of audience manipulation. I end with it because even after over 100 times of reading it, I can barely get through it without losing it. So I'll try. <clears throat> Baptized. Look out your window. The dead live everywhere. Think of your luxuries as corpses. Count the bodies. 30 hacked children for a new PlayStation. 20 tortured women so you can text, phones from the, text photos from the party. 50 amputated men waving their missing hands as sweet Andrew mindlessly bounces his rubber ball. I held an eight-year-old girl in my lap who had been raped by so many women, by so many men, she had an extra hole inside her. When she accidentally peed on me, I was baptized. It isn't over there, the Congo. It's inside everything you do and touch or do not do. Thank you. Thank you, Kaisar. You'll have to extend center stage for the Q&A. I can't help but go back to my rhetoric about fundamental duty number five, which is I mean, we don't know any of our duties, but most people don't know any of our duties. A fundamental duty number five emphasizes the fact that we need to renounce practices which are derogatory to women. And I won't speak about the world, I'll speak about India, because growing up in Bombay, I don't think I had seen too much of Eve teasing. And it used to, it used to be a Delhi thing. And I used to think, Delhi mein koi dirty old men karte honge. 12 years ago when I came to Delhi, I realized it's not dirty old men only who do it, it's also youngsters who do it because they think they are God's gift to womankind. And now Bombay has also changed, so there's Eve teasing in Bombay also, it's happening all over the place. Last year there were two young boys who were killed in Bombay because they stood up to Eve teasers, right? But this is what is happening and I, I, sometimes when I travel in the metro, you know, if I'm standing in the compartment near the ladies' compartment, I see men just stand there and behave like they're God's gift to women. And I actually feel like doing something to them, but I, I try, try to tell the women, why don't you slap them? You know? And I, I think it's time that people rose up to this. So we'll open the floor with questions for Kaisard. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll start with... Uh, Please use the other microphone since this is not working. We we'll lose time otherwise. Just make it brief, less yes, than one minute. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening uh, speech because we are into, we have, we are joining this one billion and we have already started it from 25th uh, of November, International Anti Women's Violence yes, Day, so with uh, 16 days activism and campaigning with the Padhyatra on this. Correct. I just want to, uh, it's a statement or a question, I don't know, but I'm so moved about uh, this because we are very intensively working on violence against women, that uh, it's true that patriarchy is behind this. But uh, it's, it's so surprising that uh, even those educated people, you know, they also today in this uh, meeting also, in this workshop also, we have heard when, when the gender issue came, that women are blamed for, uh, for uh, killing the fetus inside the womb. 
you know so i i think uh, we we really need to uh, look into ourselves and see that why why do we say that women is against women you know that proverb is so common and it it hits back on us which is said in hindi mahila hi mahila ki dushman hoti hai and we have been fighting that and i i, I really i am feeling so happy that you as a man i'm sorry a male speaking on this issue so passionately because uh, patriarchy and the patriarchal mindset is so pakka with that rcc cement i don't know which cement that it is it is so inside us and i feel behind all this is the religion our religion which tells us uh, why whether it's mahabharat ramayan or anything and today we are quoted for that and we are we are being told that uh, you have to behave like that please tell me you said dismantling of patriarchy how will it happen ma'am please make a brief how yeah, will it happen i i think i i i think i think um, you know um patriarchy is so insidious and it's it's been around for so long and it, it's so well structured and so well rooted that that like all sort of great machines it becomes most powerful when it becomes invisible um and and because patriarchy is largely invisible and because we have trained women so well to do our dirty work um i i think i i would not just blame religion or i think religion has played its fair sort of starring role in the in the uh, oppression of women um co corporations are doing no better today i mean let's be honest about that not every corporation but many corporations um i consider and i i think i'm going to step on a few toes but i consider whitening creams to be a form of violence against women uh, largely because women so far at least are the sort of dominant market with whitening creams um because again what we're doing is we're finding new and sort of improved ways of telling women that they're not good enough the way they are so somehow being dark is 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 a trait that you need to sort of you know um again make invisible we're, we're constantly trying to make women invisible through these processes of patriarchy and we don't even realize that what's at operation is a patriarchy absolutely i think we have to start with that um i think Th pooja has a question thank you kaizad yeah but whitening creams are also brainwashing men nowadays you are fair and handsome also so, and that's the only penchant for fairness in this country pooja has a question yes hi kaizad hi pooja I have goosebumps listening to you. Um I want your response on something. Um I asked a, a very very senior person in the police um a few years ago and I said um you know this, this is on two issues. So I asked him why you know uh, I'd read something about gang rape being on the rise because it's the toughest to convict people. so it's easier apart from the fact that it's easier to inflict the rape uh his point was he says you always blame the cops and he says you normally read about arrests being made but you don't read about our convictions one second is media is so good at reporting the crime they're not good at reporting convictions or the punishment mm. and i've lived in dubai for about 5 years and the difference was society is scared because you you print people's pictures you highlight convictions which doesn't happen in india now if you if there was a larger movement by the media to really go after people who've been even ruben and keegan i mean we all remember how they were murdered and the hype that was there and the protests how many of us really know what happened to those guys so is it as difficult as we really make it out to be don't we just need two three very very strong sound examples of fast track court justice done in say 15 days 20 days comes on the front page and maybe uh we'd see a change it's not as tough as we make it sound mm i i i think there's that's part of it and i i certainly don't want to make every man and every cop uh and every lawyer judge uh sound culpable in this um the the issue however is and i'll i'll give you um just a very quick example of a case we helped a, a young girl in bangalore who had been the victim of an acid attack um by um her boss whose advances she had refused um he was eventually after a lot of trouble was eventually sort of brought into the trial system and even convicted and even imprisoned but in seven and a half years he was walking free while that young woman is blind for life will no matter how many plastic surgeries she she has will never look the way she did prior to the attack there's a case in um, in mumbai right now at the kem hospital of nurse aruna shanbag who in 1973 was raped by a ward boy 
and she still lies there in a vegetative state. Uh, some 60, some almost approaching uh, some 50 some years. And the guy who, um, the, the ward boy who molested her was sort of punished and then again seven and a half years he was let out. So I think the, the, the reforms that are needed are sort of comprehensive, comprehensive. Um, social, legislative, religious, um, and, and that's why this problem has its roots in a lot of other things. So I think if we start to address the issue of women, we'll see a lot of these things sort of at least start to fade away, if not hopefully disappear. Thank you, Kaisar. We'll take one more question. Okay, Titiya, you shall have the last question. Uh, just a quick, quick response to what you were saying. And the reason that these stories don't stick in the media and kind of, you know, uh, slide into oblivion so quickly is because all media in our country is from the male gaze and men don't want to know about rapists and women who are raped and what happened and the tragedy associated with it. So it's also about changing the way that I mean, the media, I mean, everything in the media, be it, you know, cinema, music videos, everything is reported from and to, from, from, from a, from a, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. It's, it is a male gaze, absolutely. The way, the way that you see television in our country, it's from a male gaze, there's no denying that. I, and that's why stories like this would not stick. Yeah, I would, I would sort of largely agree with that. Even Ekta Kapoor, looks at women from a patriarchal male point of absolutely, view. Absolutely. She is not looking at them because what sells is that patriarchal view of women. Yeah, um, because, because you know, I, 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 have I, I, I agree. I mean, the entire media, even IPL today is less of sport and more of sleaze. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I have a dear friend who made a movie called Cocktail this past year. And I have never seen a more regressive portrayal of women on, on, on the modern screen yeah. uh, in, in a long, long time. Yeah. And, and so, but, but I don't think they even intentionally did that. They just thought this is great entertainment and this will sell. Um, so, so that dismantling, again, coming back to absolutely, what you were saying. Absolutely. So, I mean, it, it is going to take, and also, you know, to address this lady who, just, who, was, uh, who asked the previous question, was that you'll be able to, it is going to take a long time to dismantle patriarchy, you know, patriarchies because it is the only system that we've known. We have never existed. Our civilization has never existed without, without being sort of, you know, propped up. There have been exceptions, but yeah. you're largely correct. No, yes. In our, in our, I, I mean, in our, yes. in our country, in our culture. Sure. Yeah. Secondly, I think another, uh, the, the, the other question that I had was that, you know, I, you, you spoke really beautifully about this culture of shaming of women, you know, where. If you get raped, it's your fault. If uh, there's domestic violence, it's the woman who has to kind of keep the, sh you know, the honor of the family and keep quiet. And it's so much easier to communicate it to an, ur to an urban audience, you know, using theater and so many other means. How do you communicate this to a, how do you change this? How do you break this cycle in a more, you know, in, in small towns and in, and in rural settings? It's, it's, it's very difficult. And if you, uh, were, uh, yesterday, Dr. Nairin Daruwala, who spoke, spoke about that, not just the rural, but even in the sort of urban poor slum, the, the, the ideas are so deeply entrenched and socialized. I mean, when somebody rapes a young child of two months because they think they're going to get cured of their disease, where do you begin? Do you begin with psychology Swift and counseling? Swift and brutal punishment is where you well, Yeah, of course you begin with punishment. Of this course you begin. This has to be but dealt it's, it's with, with the godmen. Yeah, yeah. Everybody. But, but the corporations are no better today. I mean, what are the corp? I mean, you know, uh, one of the things, and this co contradicts a little what Jerry said yesterday. One of the things that I, I, I'm not capable of counseling women who've been abused. I'm not capable of nursing them back to health. So one of the things that we've decided to do is that we can use our art to raise awareness and to raise funds. And I cannot tell you how futile sometimes an exercise it is trying to convince corporations to pay attention to this, both with their actions and their money. Um, you, you know, they would much rather give 25 lakhs for a fashion show um, where, you know, they get to hobnob with hot models than they would to sort of some meaningful art, and not just mine, I'm not talking about just, but anything, that really wants to sort of combat these issues. So, so it's, it's th this is, I mean, this is, um, I mean, I know that the issue will not be solved in my lifetime, and I think I still have a few good years to live, um, but, but we have to start somewhere. We just absolutely have to start somewhere. 
Thank yes, you thank so you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. The whole, an entire idea of pro pro project procurement today is about how can you woo them with pretty young things. The entire concept of PR and advertising, so, sorry, but it's based on that today. I'm so happy I left the industry long ago. Yeah, thank you so much about that. Thank you, Kaizad. That was a very compelling speech. Thank you so much. So that was Kaizad Kotwal, Emmy Award winner, actor, playwright, and a firebrand social activist. We sometimes chat on Facebook, and it's amazing to see how like-minded we are. So good.